Well, every blessing to you all and uh, welcome back to the open air pulpit. In my last video, I mentioned how we need to be careful uh, as to how we decipher readings, whether from the church fathers or the reformers. All these individuals were just men. They weren't inspired, of course. Only the writers of the Bible were inspired and their writings were inspired, not the writers per se. And I made reference last time how I've just updated my 2006 article on Calvinism. I think it's been updated twice in the last eight years. And it was well worth doing because you forget so much. If you're like I am, always reading, always studying, always trying to understand the ways of the world, you forget so much. And also updating my article, I was able to add more information uh, to a subject which fascinated me. If you research John Calvin, and I would suggest you do, it's very interesting what he doesn't say. For example, he doesn't mention in explicit detail how or why he got saved. And that's interesting because when I got saved, I wanted people to know about it. And I've spoken about my testimony, I've written about it, and I'm quite happy to offer my testimony, to share it with those that want to hear. But for reasons beyond me, he only mentions it once primarily during his commentary on the Psalms. Some Calvinists suggest it took a long time for him to get saved. I'm not even sure if he was saved. You see, my understanding of John Calvin was that he was primarily a philosopher and an academic. And when you put those two together, you are looking at a dangerous combination. On top of Calvin being a philosopher and an academic, he also had no understanding of how the world worked. He never had a job. And this is a problem, I think, when you get into organized religion. One of the credentials for being an elder, according to 1 Timothy chapter three, I think it is, or chapter four, thereabouts, is that the elder is to be known in his or her community. And that means one of two things. First of all, I think it means to be a worker in your community, to be known in your community. And also it means to be a street preacher in your community. And I get a little bit uh, frustrated, I suppose, when I come across so-called academics, you know, who put pen to paper and they offer all their thoughts to the church about this subject or that subject, and yet they've never worked in the real world. The same is true of Martin Luther to some extent. I mean, he was a priest. From a priest, he became, you know, a well-known Protestant leader. But he too never really came into contact with the average man or woman in the street. But going back to Calvin, as I say, he's an interesting man in some ways because he's a philosopher, as are most Calvinists, and he is an academic, as are most Calvinists. And uh, he, moved, he moved among very uh, well-to-do circles. He came from a very privileged background. He even rubbed shoulders with royalty. So you just have to wonder, was he ever really saved? I don't know. He also went to the same college as Ignatius Loyola went. That's very interesting, isn't it? That Calvin and Loyola are at the same college at the same time. And I believe they met one another. I think in that, during that time, academics like those two couldn't help but come into contact with one another. Of course, Loyola went on to create the Jesuits. Calvin went on to create the Calvinist system. There's been much, much, uh, much debate over the years about what Calvin actually believed when it came to limited atonement. And what I'll do is I'll link my article, if I may, into the description box with this video. So if you get a chance, click on the article and read it. It runs to 75 pages, so it's quite a long article. It'll take you a while to read it, so pace yourself. But I think Calvin met uh, Ignatius, and uh, those two pretty much changed the world, really. But Calvin, like I said, was a philosopher, and he allegorized many areas of the scriptures. He said that the thousand-year reign of Christ was childish. Luther called it a dream. And also of interest to me was Calvin's fascination with Augustine. He refers to Augustine 400 times in his institutes. He calls him Holy Father, my revered father, he almost worships the man. And yet, Augustine was a Catholic. Augustine condoned with the worship of Mary. In fact, I don't think 
Augustine would have reciprocated such praises to Calvin. In fact, I'll say this, I don't think Calvin would have survived in Augustine's state. But politics and religion is a funny thing. Calvin was incapable of discerning the difference between the church and the state. He imposed his theocracy on the people of Geneva. Over 65 people were murdered in Geneva, directly and indirectly, due to Calvin. But go back to his praises of Augustine. Augustine thought that the Septuagint was inspired. Augustine said, if you don't have the church as your mother, you can't be saved. So why is John Calvin praising Augustine? Calvin also praised the writings of Plato and other unsaved Greek individuals. I think Aristotle was another writer that he credited. I've watched several messages from R.C. Sproul. He thinks that men like Thomas Aquinas are worth quoting. He cites him as a Christian, and yet Aquinas is a Roman Catholic. And on top of that, he's a saint, which means Catholics can pray to him. Why doesn't R.C. speak out against such heresy? Go back to the Reformation, if you will, and I think if you were to analyse it as openly and as honestly as you possibly could, you would have to come to the following conclusion that the reformers really wanted to reform the Church of Rome. Luther said that he was quite content to uphold the ordinances of the Church of Rome. The system per se was of no problem to them. But once they realised that they couldn't reform it, they turned against it. And I said last time how Martin Luther made some bizarre statements. He called the Epistle of James an Epistle of Straw. He failed to understand justification in the sight of man, James 2, versus justification in the sight of God, Romans chapter 4. He continued along with Calvin and other reformers the ridiculous doctrine of baptizing infants. And Calvin and Luther knew, but especially Luther knew, that if he informed his congregations, his parishioners, that infant baptism wasn't needed, that it was quite possible that the parents of these children wouldn't go to church anymore. And he would lose their attendance, and he would lose their children's attendance, and within a while he would lose probably half of his church. So Calvin and Luther continued to baptise infants along with many other of the reformers. A few weeks ago, Ian Paisley died, a well-known five-point Calvinist, and I had two issues with Mr. Paisley. My first issue was he baptised infants, which of course is part of the Calvinist problem, and my second problem with him was how he would march with the Orange Order. And the Orange Order, for those that don't know, is a Masonic organisation. Its roots are in Freemasonry. And I wrote to Mr Paisley, and I received a response from his son, which I think is in my article on Calvinism. So please read it, and uh, you can take from that what you will. But I want to be consistent. I've just finished writing about the Catholic Church, which will be November's article for our newsletter. And if you want to get our newsletter, let me know, and I will add you to our main list. And when I look at the Catholic Church, and I am horrified by pretty much everything that I, that I come across. So it's inconsistent of me to speak out against the Church of Rome, and not do so against Calvinism. So on that point, I want to share some bullet points from my article, if I may, because I think people need to be aware of this and uh, just treat the reformers as you would anyone else. Check what they say in light of scripture. Don't accept their writings simply because your pastor suggests they are legit. R.C. Sproul said the following quote, to be sure, it is possible that Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin and Edwards 
could all be wrong on this matter in reference of course to Calvinism predestination one Calvinist writer had the uh, good sense to say the following quote John Calvin was part of a long line of thinkers who based their doctrine of predestination on the Augustinian interpretation of St. Paul. He quotes him 400 times in the Institutes. Why is he quoting a Roman Catholic? Something's not right here, but let's move on. Augustine said that Mary was sinless, as I've already referred, and promoted worship of her. Why is Calvin promoting Augustine? I'll just give you the bullet points, as I say, I haven't got time to give you long uh, quotes. You can do so by reading the article. Calvin also, at times, seemed to place too much emphasis on the literal flesh and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even Calvinists have gone on to comment on his almost transubstantiation interpretation of the Mass. From 1542 to 1546, 58 people were executed and 76 exiled from Geneva. Those guilty of adultery and fornication were given the death penalty and some were fined and imprisoned. He couldn't distinguish the Old Testament from the New Testament. And if you can't delineate the two, you're in great trouble. As I say, he quotes Augustine 400 times, he calls him a holy man and holy father. But the Bible says, call no man father, call no man rabbi. I come across messianic Christians calling their rabbi, rabbi. Why are you doing that? You know it's wrong for the Catholics to do it with their priests. Why do you call rabbis, rabbi? You have one teacher who is Christ. And also this view from the Mass of Christ, the Roman Catholic Mass, is credited back to Augustine, the first, the first true Catholic. He called the millennium, as I say, childish, and Luther called it a dream. In fact, he failed to understand the book of Revelation altogether. Bullinger, one of uh, Calvin's colleagues, said, uh, Believe me, many are displeased with what you say in your institutes about predestination, meaning that the Lord hates most people and loves only the elect and died only for the elect. That's Calvinism in a nutshell. And he made a statement, Calvin, which I think is incredible. He said, quote, no one will ever attempt to disprove the doctrine which I have set forth herein, but he who may imagine himself to be wiser than the spirit of God. What a statement to make. He's almost claiming to be inspired by God himself. In fact, he claimed to be the equivalent of the Apostle Paul and Ezekiel. And yet, during my research to November's article, I have a quote from Pope Pius VIII, who claimed he was God. I have a quote from Pope Pius XI, who said he was the way, the truth, and the life. And how many Catholics do you think corrected those popes when that statement was made? Not one. How many Calvinists correct Calvin for making that statement? Probably none. And yet, if I was to say to you all today that no one can ever disprove my theology, my doctrine, my ministry, whatever, and if you do so, you are wiser than the Spirit of God, how many of you people watching this video would correct me? Many, I would hope. Many would unsubscribe to this channel, I would hope. But not many corrected John Calvin. One more time. No one will ever attempt to disprove the doctrine, predestination, which I have set forth herein. But he who may imagine himself to be wiser than the Spirit of God. And did you get that? John Calvin is claiming to have divine inspiration. The popes do that. They call that papal infallibility. They call that ex cathedra. And as an ex Catholic, I rebuke it, I stand against it. But when John Calvin says it, no one says anything about it. People say, well, I haven't read the Institutes, but I believe in the Tulip. You believe in the Tulip because your pastor has read the Institutes. 
you believe the tulip because your YouTube teacher has read the Institutes. You've got it indirectly from him. Here's a nice little humble hymn. We are the Lord's elect few. Let all the rest be damned. There's room enough in hell for you. We won't have heaven crammed. I didn't say that. Some Calvinists said that. You gonna correct them? You gonna rebuke them? Hope you do. If I said that, I would hope you'd, you, know, you would rebuke me. Arthur Pink, he's a favorite among Calvinists. And uh, he wrote a book called The Sovereignty of God. And when it first came out, it was very difficult to sell. And uh, one of Mr. Pink's colleagues broke fellowship with him over his adoption of Calvin's pernicious teaching how Christ died just for the elect. How Christ hates most of mankind and loves only the elect. Mr. Pink used to be a contributor to our magazine. His articles on gleanings on Genesis are good and we had them printed in book form. But when he began to teach his frightful doctrines which make the God of love a monster, we broke fellowship with him. That's Calvinism in a nutshell. So I think you've got a general flavour of where I'm going with my updated article on Calvinism and uh, the Pope of Protestantism, as he was called. I personally have no time for it. And like I said last time, if you are a part of such a system, I would hope you'd come away from it quick smart. Only the word of God is inspired. The church fathers made many mistakes. They got some things right, but they made many mistakes. The reformers got some things right, but they too made many mistakes. John Calvin, like I say, was a philosopher slash academic. And uh, I think when you get into the whole realm of what it takes to be an elder, what it takes to be a credible Bible teacher, I think Calvin fails. I think it's unfortunate that men like him, academics like him, have never had jobs, have never lived in the real world, and they are simply, uh, they're simply regurgitating writings from men like Augustine, an unsaved Catholic. I'm not sure Calvin was ever saved. If he was saved, he's probably one of the worst examples of a Christian you'll ever come across. Martin Luther, was a little better, but he too had many problems. His hatred of the Jews went back to his days as a Catholic. And we know from Hitler, when he made a statement along the lines of how he was dealing with the Jewish problem as the Church of Rome had been doing for 1500 years before he arrived on the scene. This is why it's so important when you get born again to go back to the Bible and stick with the Bible and pick your writers very carefully. You can follow a writer, a Bible teacher, and get so messed up following that person. For the Catholics living during the time of the Reformation, the reformers were a breath of fresh air. And when they taught faith alone for salvation and scripture alone for doctrine, the Lord blessed them. But when they went back to baptizing infants and almost offering a transubstantiation view on the mass, and rubbishing the millennium and other, problem, another, another major areas of scripture, they fell into many problems. And that's why I think Calvin died so young. He was 55, I think, when he died. I think the Lord's judgment was, was upon that man. Many people died in Geneva. Michael Servetus would be the most famous account. You know, you think of Calvin, you think of Servetus, you think of Kennedy, you think of Oswald. The two go hand in hand. Servetus denied the Trinity, but that wasn't justification to have him murdered. And like I said earlier, you know, earlier on in this message, Calvin and many of his colleagues failed to distinguish the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament was a theocracy, God dealing with the children of Israel from heaven. But the New Testament is God dealing with mankind via the new birth, to be born from above. And I mentioned that last time, didn't I? So read the article, if you may, take from it what you will. And uh, as I say, we have to be consistent as Bible believers and we have to check everyone's writings in light of scripture. 
and uh, I hope this video has been a blessing to you and I'll speak to you all very soon. The Lord bless you, Maranatha. Two quick PS's, almost forgot. Arthur Pink, like I say, was ostracized by many in the Christian world. And he went on to become a recluse. He ended up dying in Scotland with his wife, almost uh, cut off from the Christian world. And some people would come to the conclusion that he too fell under judgments, as did John Calvin. At one time, Pink was a very popular man, pastoring churches in different parts of the world, I believe, but he ended up in the Scottish Hebrides, of all places, writing a newsletter to a very small number of people. His ministry had literally collapsed overnight, God's judgment. Also, Calvin held to the belief that Christ went to hell when he died and was tortured in hell. Now, I can't accept that. Kenneth Hagen, Joyce Mayer, Todd Bentley, and all those demon-possessed maniacs hold to that view. I don't believe that. When the Lord said it's finished, it was finished. Yes, he went into hell to take the righteous dead back to glory, Luke 16, and he preached to the unsaved dead, the demons, in the other part of hell. We know from Luke 16 that hell was a two-part apartment. The righteous on one section, the unrighteous on another section. But he was not tortured in hell. And I'm not sure if Calvin believed that Christ was the first born-again man. Another heresy. But again, it goes back to a flawed doctrine, a misunderstanding of Scripture. And these guys, they miss the simplicity of Christ because of academics. They read into the text something which is not there, which is what Augustine did. And that's why it's so important, if you're saved, to start off on the right footing. Get your teacher right. Pick your teacher carefully. Pick your ministry carefully. Because I've met people who have started out, they've started off, you know, being born again, and they've gone to a church, they've followed a system, and it's completely messed them up. I mentioned a few videos ago the lady I met who's a so-called Christian clairvoyant. You know, she told me she's born good. And she told me that Jesus Christ was a clairvoyant as well. What a messed up character. Who has messed that woman up? Whoever's messed her up will be severely ostracized by the Lord Jesus Christ. At the judgment seat, if they're saved, or the great white throne judgment, if they are not saved. But like I say, please pick your teacher and ministry carefully. And I'll say this also, and I have to say this, get yourself a King James Bible and use it. Read it and check everyone out in light of scripture. The Lord bless you all, Amaranatha.